Welcome back, BC students, and here we go. Buckle up, because we're ready to take a look at what has the worst reputation probably all of Calvary, BC as being maybe one of the more complex topics, the Lagrange error bound. But we can get through this. It's not going to wreak as much terror in your lives as you might think. Just pay very close attention. If you need to pause, rewind, listen to some things again, we will get you through the Lagrange error. All right, so what do we have here? Well, basically, let's motivate. Why do we even study this? Up until now, we've been using some Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials to approximate the value of a pretty nasty looking function. Our thought process is now going to change because we really are interested in now wondering how close are these approximations? Are we wasting our time doing them? Or are they close enough that we could pretty much rely on them? And so that becomes the motivation to figure out what uh, we, we need to do to ensure we can determine how close we are. And it all starts here with this idea of the f of x being the exact value of your function. Let's say it's the sine of an x value like 0 0.2. Well, that can be approximated by the Taylor polynomial or Maclaurin polynomial of whatever degree you want, second, third, fourth. But we're always going to fall a little short because we have to add some kind of leftover because we know that the polynomial is only ever, ever going to be an approximation. And so it's this remainder, it's this r sub n of x that seems to be intriguing us. And I want you to realize that as we move through this particular uh, lesson, the word remainder and the word error are going to be used interchangeably. They're essentially the same thing. And so the remainder will serve as that error. And that error is really nothing more than just what we get when we take the actual value of the function minus the approximated value. We don't care which one's positive, which one's negative, which one's bigger, which one's pos uh, smaller. We just put the absolute values and we take the, the difference, the positive difference between them. Well, OK, that sounds great. But how does this fit in with our Taylor polynomial? Well, once we link it together with what we discussed in topic 1011, then we have something that starts to become pretty powerful. So if you look here at theorem 1021, Taylor's formula and the Lagrange error bound, if you recall, we have our function f of x that is approximated by this particular polynomial, right? C can be centered at 0, 1, whatever. It doesn't matter if this is Maclaurin or Taylor. But notice that I can get by using an equal sign here. Yep, as long as I add on that remainder, because that's going to be the piece that I'm missing out on for my accuracy. But what is that remainder we speak of? Well, it's going to be defined here as the nth plus one derivative of the function f evaluated at some z over n plus one factorial times x minus c to the n plus one. All, of course, in absolute values. Wow. OK, let's time out. What are some of the things about this particular expression that sound familiar? Well, it looks like we're going to the very next term the term that would follow the nth derivative term. OK, I think we've heard of that before, maybe with our alternating series. But let's keep thinking about this. What the heck is this z? Well, if we read up here, a function's differentiable, uh, differentiable through orders n plus 1 in an interval i that contains z, then for each x of that interval, there's going to be a z that lies between x. That's where you want to approximate, and see where you are centered so that this is true. So we have this very elusive z. And I'm going to tell you, it is the z that bothers students the most. And I'm here to tell you that it's the z that should bother you the least. Now, I want you to think about those words as we move through some of our examples. Don't get too worked up about finding or knowing what z is. Because quite frankly, sometimes we can't find it. And most of the time, we don't care. So 
where do we go from here? Well, we got a little biography of Lagrange here. If you want to read this on your own, you can pause the video. But he was a very influential cat in the calculus realms. And in fact, he's the one that pretty much is now renowned for using the prime notation for a derivative uh, for the first time. So he was a very close colleague to Leonard Euler, and he was very active, very, very active in the development of calculus, especially in series. So one more thing that we got to talk about, and I think we can get ready to roll on. Remember how we talked about this Z? What if we can't find it? Well, how on earth are we supposed to find the nth plus one derivative of f and evaluate it at something that we can't find? Well, we get around that by just extrapolating what we think the maximum value of that nth plus one derivative evaluated at z. We'll figure out how big can it possibly get. And if we figure that out, then we know that our remainder is just going to be less than that. And therefore, we now have a bound. We have an error bound. We know that we can't be any worse than that. And that's how we're going to pretty much handle things. And, and so again, the Z is very overrated. Don't worry yourself about it. So here we go. Let's take a look at an example. So what we've got here is a problem that states the third degree Maclaurin polynomial. We have a Maclaurin going on here. Let me call up my, uh, whoops. All right, some technical difficulties, but we're good to go. Here we see it's the third degree, uh, the third Maclaurin polynomial for the function sine of x is given by this P3. And, and we're not going to have to go through the process of finding that. We we know what that is. Um, if we had to find it, it would take us all but two seconds to probably develop that using our topic 1011 skills. Uh, but I wanted to streamline the problem a little bit and make sure I provided that for you. Use Taylor's theorem to approximate the sine of 0 0.1 by using that third polynomial and then determine the accuracy. So we have a lot going on here in the wings, um, one of which is the Taylor's inequality in this teeny tiny little box here so that we wouldn't have to flip back and forth. So we'll refer to that. So here's how we're going to start things. We are going to say, using good notation, because part of the AP exam does like students to communicate their mathematics properly. And so we're going to say the sine of point 0.1, the sine of point 0.1 is approximately the same as the third degree Taylor polynomial, or Maclaurin in this case, evaluated at point 0.1, which indeed happens to be what we get when we replace point 0.1 in for those x's. So let's do that. Point 0.1 minus the quantity point 0.1 cubed all over 3 factorial. Now, I want you to know that in the course of solving this problem, we will be able to access our calculator. And I know that sounds kind of silly because one of the things that I'm trying to relate to you is how the founding fathers of calculus were able to work with these, of course, without a calculator. But the calculator is just going to do some of these mundane calculations for us that we could probably have done by pencil and paper 350 years ago if we were motivated to do so. Uh, for the purpose here, I'm going to try to avoid the calculator as much as I can to see if we're comfortable here. That 0.1 to the third, I believe that that would be the same as point. Uh, zero, uh, zero, 001, I believe that's 1 over 1,000, basically. And if I put that 1 over 1,000 in the denominator, or that 1,000, I should say, in the denominator, join it with a 3 factorial, which is 6, I essentially have 6,000. And I don't know why, for the life of me, I didn't change 0.1 to a fraction. My goodness, let's just make that happen. And so if we have a tenth minus 1 over 6,000, we basically can get a common denominator of 6,000. This would be 600 over 6,000, and we would end up with 599 over 6,000. I am not so concerned about this fractional answer, and, and that's fine if you're like, hey, I'm going to go straight to my calculator. Do it. Go for it. I'm not going to type this in because I know you all would be able to do this, but you get 0 0.0998 followed by a 3 that would repeat. 
And so that is the approximation for the sine. Maybe it's pretty close. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But that's not really what we're after. We want to figure out how close we are, not by what we would get on a calculator, but what we would get by using this Taylor inequality. And that Taylor inequality is right up here, as you can see. And so it reads absolute value of r sub n. Well, in this case, our n is a 3. We're using the third degree polynomial. And if I just write it in general, and it's not a bad idea to practice writing this, because if you do, you're more apt to memorize it. And so I'm just going to write exactly what it is, the maximum of the nth plus 1 derivative, which specific to this problem would be the fourth derivative, evaluated at what? Z, which we still don't really have a handle on. Of course, all of this would be over 4 factorial. And then we would finish up by essentially multiplying this by x to the uh, uh, x minus 0 here to the fourth power. All right. And of course, all of this would be thought of as positive. And we can now evaluate. So let's just do that right now. In fact, let's evaluate it in such a way that we're going to be finding specifically this r sub 3 at the point 1. So basically what that just simply means is anytime I come across an x, I'm going to replace it with point 1. So here we are. The maximum of the fourth derivative. Okay, well let's think about that. If I take my function, which I'm going to highlight up here, sine of x, let's take four derivatives. So we don't even have to write them down. First derivative, cosine second derivative, negative sine, third derivative, negative cosine, fourth derivative, I think we go right back to sine. Okay. What is the maximum value that the sine would acquire at some z where z is between... <laughs> Change my color here. z is between... Well, remember, z has to be between x and c. In this problem, c is where we're centered. Maclaurin says 0. And x is this point 1. So it would actually be written in that order. And for that very reason, this is supposed to be, key words, key, key symbols, supposed to be where z is. But that is a problem. Because I don't know about you, but I really can't find what is the maximum value of the sine curve between x0 and x.1. I have no idea. I do know it occurs at point 1 because the sine curve is increasing until it gets to about, what, pi over 2? Hmm. Well, that's no good because if I get this straight... I'm supposed to know the sine of point 1 to be able to approximate the error of the sine of point 1. Well, that just is stupid, right? I hate to say it, but it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. So here's what we're going to do. This is a bound, you guys. So it's okay if we find ourselves a little bit less accurate than we need to be. And over here in my tip window, if f of x is the sine of x or the cosine of x, the value that we're going to use for the maximum is going to be 1, because we know that about the sine curve and the cosine curve. And I know it's anticlimactic. It's not what we want to hear. But the fact is, if we're really talking about working through this problem without a calculator, that's what we have to do. Now remember, I didn't need the calculator to do this. I got that 599 over 6,000 without the use of one. But if I needed to convert this to a decimal, I, I could have done that by pencil and paper. If I needed to find the maximum value of something between these two, I could not have done that on pencil and paper. We're going to replace x with 0.1, raise him to the fourth power. And then what we're going to find out is when we simplify this, this 0.1 to the fourth is actually 1 over 10,000. When you multiply that by a 24, 
you get 1 over 24,000. Now, I'm going to go ahead and turn that into a decimal only because I really want to, to, to put this into a little bit better perspective. And I think that you can relate to decimals a little bit. But this is a tiny little number, you guys. This is actually 0. Point, hmm, let me think here. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros until I get to a 4, I believe. And then it's a 1 and a 6 repeating. Let me make sure I counted that right. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's what I got. Now, if you want this in scientific notation, if you're one of those people, it would be 4.16 repeating times 10 to the negative sixth power. I don't know about you, but that looks pretty darn accurate. And I want you to also realize that I computed this by taking the absolute worst possible result from the maximum of the fourth derivative of sine. One is probably bigger than what he would have been evaluated on this interval. But yet, <laughs> I think I got a pretty good degree of accuracy. I don't feel like uh, if I'm off by this much, my bridge would necessarily fall down if I needed to compute the sine of point 0.1 to build that bridge. I don't know. I've never built a bridge, so don't quote me on that. But I think that that's a pretty good degree of accuracy if I don't say so myself. Now, let's wrap up the problem. What is the actual error? This is really what we're trying to find. So the actual error, and you might have to refer back to the beginning of the notes we said, that the error is just really the absolute value between our actual answer, sine of 0.1, and our approximated value, p sub 3, evaluated at the 0 0.1. All right, now to do this, I have to use the calculator. So I'm going to jump over to the calculator, and we're going to see what this says. So here we go. I've taken the liberty to go ahead and uh, write out that uh, third degree polynomial, but I've, it's not stored. So what I'm going to do here is let's store that. Let's make this actually work for us. So I'll just put a colon equal here instead. And now I'll get the done, which means it's done. It's stored in. And tell you what, we'll clean that up and get rid of it. So what are we looking for here? Well, we want to figure out the absolute value of the sine of 0.1, which would look like that, minus our third degree polynomial evaluated at 0.1. Now, if we compute that, it's going to give us a very accurate decimal. In fact, it's in scientific notation. I don't know. Can we highlight that, hit enter, and leave scientific notation? Unfortunately, we really can't. But Let's say if I want to type this in, can you imagine seven zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, followed by those values? What this is, is the actual error. And if you compare this to the value that we found on our paper, which was 4.16 times 10 to the negative sixth power, we can see that we are definitely a lot closer closer and within that particular tolerance level. So if we go back to the document, we'll show you what to write up here. Remember this number, 8.331 times 10 to the negative eighth power. So again, we had this approximated to be, do you remember that decimal? I remember it. It was 8.331, it had some change to it, times 10 to the negative eighth. And basically, we can see that by using this bound here, we got a result that was certainly larger than what our actual error was, but that's OK. We're able to see that we're pretty darn accurate no matter what. And so we could kind of say, state that point that this is less than that nth plus one derivative term evaluated at z's max 
over 4 factorial times 0.1 to the fourth. I know it's a lot going on, so it can be very confusing, but I promise you, as with anything I have taught you all year, you work on this, you practice the problems, it will make sense. I would not blow this off because it just doesn't seem to sit well with kids who just watch a video or two. You've got to really immerse yourself and practice a little bit. And then we've got a couple examples coming up that's going to enable you to do just that. So be sure to stick around for those videos. 